And I invite you to join me in prayer. Holy Spirit, we thank you for the life that you plant within us. Whether it is by bread or by cup, by the waters of baptism. And we pray and ask that that growth within us would continue throughout our days. Amen. So last Sunday I talked about uh, how we are fed, how we are nurtured. And I was wondering, did you enjoy your cannibalism last week? Was it, was it a good cannibalistic experience for you as it was for me? You know, we just sang a song about eating Christ's flesh and, and drinking his blood. And I think that we lose sight of how weird that is because we're so used to it. It's such familiar language to us. Um, even kind of culturally, I think that outside of church, outside of Christianity, it doesn't have, its innate weirdness gets kind of rubbed away, rubbed smooth by consistent use. You can look historically and see how our weirdness was abundantly clear to other cultures when Christianity like first arrived. Whether it was, uh, unfortunately, many times historically it was at gunpoint. Uh, other times historically it was by way of missionaries going or just cultural exchange. People encountered Christianity and the initial encounters are very similar. People say, you know, there, there are these people coming. They're called Christians and they wear white and they're cannibals, they drink the flesh of their god, and they splash or they dunk babies and adults sometimes. And also there's usually some local tradition that we're going to overturn. Uh, a few years ago I was reading a lot in the Icelandic and Norse sagas, and the reflection that they had on the coming of Christianity was, darn it, we're not going to get to eat horse meat anymore. This was a huge issue in ancient Scandinavia, that the Christians were going to come, they're going to dunk us, and they're going to make us stop eating horse meat. If you look at other cultures, they're, oh, they're going to come, they're going to make us wear shoes. But people definitely note, initially, the strangeness of Christianity. It's, we have some strange practices, and we forget how weird we are, I think. Maybe to our peril. So today, uh, we welcomed and splashed a perfectly wonderful baby in Cade. Uh, he was certainly confused as to why he was being splashed. Um, because it is kind of strange, you know, to have someone hand me their baby and I splash them and hand them back. I wouldn't do that to anyone. You know, I wouldn't do that next to a, a fountain in the mall or something. Like, this is a particular thing we do. And it's odd. We talk about the waters of baptism as being the waters of death and rebirth, of being the, the womb of new life we talk about. And this is odd for a baby. I mean, a baby was just born recently the first time, and now we're already talking about them being born a second time. Or, you know, it seems almost disrespectful to talk about death around a baby. You know, we want to focus on life. It's just as weird for adults to talk about a grown adult, and this is reflected on by Jesus' audience when he talks about people being born again. Grown adults saying, so how exactly is that going to work? Like, I was born a long time ago. A lot has happened since then. Do I really start over? But Cade took it really well, and I appreciate that. Pam has this vivid memory. I'm not calling you out, I'm just mentioning she looked up, she's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I get it, I get it. Pam had this uh, vivid memory that I think I'd blocked out or forgotten of the first baptism that I performed. Um, and she reminded me of this where the child uh, made a break for it. He took, he took off <laughs> and was just running through the sanctuary <laughs> with various people trying to entice him back. They, like, they found stuffed animals. They're like, we'll give you treats. You got to come back. And, 
And so eventually we are able to coax him back and, and baptize him. But in a way, that was a, a rational response. You know, he's going to hand me to a stranger. He's going to splash me with water. That's weird. I'm out of here. I'm glad Cade didn't try that. But if he did, I'd kind of understand. Like, I wouldn't be mad at him. Because it's, it's just strange. There are things about Christianity that are weird. And I value those things really highly because they're not, they're not co-opted. The weird things about Christianity are just us. They're markers of who we are as distinct from all the other ways we could be in the world. Play, things that, no matter where you put us, in what culture, in what part of the planet, there are a few things we do that stand out that wouldn't be like what everyone around us was doing. And those things are really valuable to me, and they, and they really show. A good example of this idea of things that are co-opted or not, if you look at Christmas, right? Christmas is a, uh, a $760 billion buying spree that most of our society is involved in and has nothing to do with Jesus of Nazareth born in a feed trough. It's like this huge commercial event. It's been co-opted largely, and you can see it when you compare Christmas to Pentecost. There's no Pentecost special on TV. There's no Pentecost parade. There's no Pentecost gifts that we exchange. If we didn't talk about Pentecost, no one would care about it. Whereas if we stopped talking about Christmas, it would keep rolling onward, I think, because it's, it's been co-opted. I really value this weirdness. I want to keep the weirdness of Christianity alive, probably partly because I myself am weird, as all of you know by now. It's been seven years. But I treasure this weirdness because it keeps us from getting confused. Like, Christianity can easily be confused for for patriotism, for capitalism, for socialism, for liberalism or conservatism, for whiteness or wokeness or niceness or civility. All of these are things that get confused with Christianity at various times. None of these things are Christianity. But sometimes from frequent use, our weirdness gets rubbed smooth. And we can forget who we are. And forget what I think is a fact, that if we consistently follow Jesus, one of the things that's going to happen is demands are going to be made of us that contradict all other demands. And we're going to have to make that choice. At least some of the time. Of whether we are going to be distinctly Christian, distinctly followers of Jesus, or something else. And cherishing this weirdness helps me remember the difference. Speaking of weirdness, this has been beyond weird last 18 months. One of the weird things about it, um, has anyone here found yourselves using things like Zoom more often than you did before the pandemic? By any chance? Or FaceTime or... Google Meet or whatever video conferencing uh, system you have. Kids spent a lot of last year in school uh, virtually, at least in our area, thank goodness, keeping them safe. And so in this time of Zoom, when so many things are happening via video chat, there have been a lot of mishaps. There have been situations where your mic is on or your camera is rolling and you don't realize it. And like you say or do something that you normally wouldn't do in that context. I won't ask for details, but has anyone had this experience? I have. More than once. Where you say something and you didn't realize your mic was live. Or you do something that's normal, you know, but would be embarrassing in a meeting context or in the context you're in via Zoom. There have been some famous examples of that. There's the teacher who taught an entire class as a potato. 
The teacher had downloaded a filter that makes her look like a potato, and she left the filter on, and so she taught an entire class as a talking cartoon potato. And she couldn't figure out why all the students were laughing and, and like muting their mics and just dying of laughter. And then a, someone made a screenshot of what it looked like for them and sent it to her, and she just canceled class that day. She was like, def she was like I'm done. I'm done. I'll see you all tomorrow. Or you may have seen on the news there was the lawyer who was in a, a virtual video court proceeding as a kitty cat. Did you see this? So there's this lawyer, he's talking to the judge, he's like, I'm not actually a kitty cat. I'm here and ready to argue the case. I mean, it, was, it was hilarious. And I mean, completely embarrassing, but, but just hilarious. And this Zoom isn't the first time we've had these experiences, right? Uh, I imagine many of us that are on social media have posted something to social media that someone saw that we didn't think was going to see it. Or maybe vice versa, we've seen something someone posted to social media that we didn't think maybe they thought we would see. I've had that experience as well. And even before social media, this reminded me of a funny story about my mom. Uh, the first, or no, this is early in her ministry, before she was fully ordained, she was like a student minister. And so she was learning at our home church as kind of in a sort of an associate pastor position. So she finishes the church service and she has a, like a, a lavalier mic um, hooked behind her ear. And it's got the little box that you click on and off at your waist, right? If you've worn one of these. So she finishes church, uh, gives the benediction, and then kind of like heads right out, you know, like she needs to go somewhere. And, and we're all standing up and greeting one another and heading out to coffee hour. But we can hear over the speakers that her mic is still live. She hasn't turned it off. And so we hear, you know, side conversations a little bit, and it's kind of funny. And then we hear the door to the bathroom open. It's a very distinct sound. It's like thud, creak, because it's like a, a big, you know, kind of uh, spring-loaded door. And I'm 12 or 13, and I'm thinking, this might be the greatest day of my life. <laughs> this is... Like, a better person would have run to tell her the person that I was, and maybe am, was waiting to see what happened. But you see, one of the deacons sprint out of the sanctuary and go barreling down the hallway, and, and you hear the door bang open, and he's like, your mic is on! And my mom goes, oh! And then click. So this has happened before. This situation where we're being seen when we don't think we're being seen, or we're being heard when we don't think we're being heard. And sometimes it's funny and embarrassing, and sometimes it can be good and, and healthful, and sometimes it can be even harmful. Like, think about this. Imagine if everything you said was overheard. especially if you couldn't decide who overheard it. Imagine if everything you said, someone would be picked at random from your life, and they would overhear whatever that was. Think back as far as you need to, to think of something you would not want to have overheard. Maybe because it would hurt the person who heard it or because it would reflect on you in a negative way and you don't want that part of you to be visible. But just imagine, if everything you said was overheard, how would that change how you speak? So if we look at this reading from Ephesians, what it says is that we should only say what builds one another up which by itself is hard enough. Maybe possible, but very difficult. And this doesn't mean that everything we say is nice, and it doesn't mean that we are a doormat for other people's behavior, but that everything we say should be intended to build one another up, even if building up someone might involve constructive criticism, 
or setting a healthy boundary. Those also build up. But we're called for everything we say to build one another up. And it also says that what we say should give grace to all who hear us, to all who overhear in the text. Now imagine again that you're overheard in everything that you've said, even this past week, past month. We don't have to go back years probably to find something you'd rather wasn't overheard. Not only would it not embarrass you, but would it give grace? If someone random overheard everything you said, would that be grace to them? Or would it be something else? I thought about this, and I realized I have a lot of work to do in this area. I did not have to think back very far to think of something that I'm glad wasn't overheard. And you may be in a similar situation. I don't know. We're called to be different. Even if you're uncomfortable with being weird, that's okay. But we are all called to be different. No matter where we find ourselves, no matter what culture we happen to live in, what language we happen to speak, a Christian should stand out. Wherever we end up, we should stand out. One of the ways we stand out is our ritual of communion, where we talk about eating Christ's body and blood, and to do with that what you will. One of the ways we stand out is with our other sacrament as Presbyterians, baptism. We baptize adults, we baptize babies, we baptize adolescents. It means something a little different each time, but... Like I said to the kids, it's the way we welcome new people into God's family. It's a little strange, though. And one of the ways we're called to stand out is in the way that we speak. That even if someone overhears us, it should be grace for them instead of embarrassment, ideally, for us. Or even hurt for them. So we could be the divine cannibals, the splashers, the dunkers, who whenever we speak, it's an offering of grace. If nothing else, when thinking about what makes us Christian, how we show the people around us who we are and who we follow, I think it's worth asking ourselves, what would people overhear when they hear you speak? Amen.